start by telling you the terrain we're going to traverse, and that way you'll have a better knowledge of where we are as we go along. The thesis of the book and of the talk that I'm going to give today is that for the first time in human history, it is possible to sell reductions in transactions costs. That is, entrepreneurs can focus on selling reductions in transactions costs. That's something different from what's been possible before. Throughout human history, people have tried to sell products, and to make the cost of the product cheaper, they've tried to find a way to reduce transactions costs. But selling reductions in transactions costs just by itself has not been possible. But we now see the intersection of three things. I carry around with me a small handheld computer that also is a communications device. Many people who are old call it a phone, but no young person has ever used it as a phone. They've never made a phone call, so they use it for other things, to text and to look at Yelp. But the point is, it's a communications device that's small and powerful and mobile. It is connected through the second thing, which is a network of networks that we call the internet, the 4G, the 5G system, but it's a means by which all of these devices can communicate with each other. And the third thing is, software packages that can be sold through a, a system of permissionless innovation. Now, we call those colloquially apps, but apps can sell almost anything. One of the things that's most important is being able to sell reductions in transactions costs. When you combine those three things, my claim is that it puts us on the verge of an economic revolution that will be comparable in its destructive effects to each of the first two main economic revolutions. Now, the first of those was the Neolithic, the transformation from hunter-gatherer society to fixed agriculture. The second was the industrial, where in, many, in much of the 1840s, the cities of Europe were on fire. So if my claim is right, then many of the institutions that we've come to depend on, including jobs, are going either to disappear or be transformed so fundamentally that it's going to be hard for us to keep track. And one of the reasons that it's difficult to parse these phenomena is there's two separate things that are going on at the same time. One is what we might call the middleman economy, where it is possible to sell reductions in transactions costs. But the second is the sharing economy. And this is something that you may not have thought of before. And if you remember only one thing from my talk, let it be this that the combination of the three things that I talked about, small computers that are also communications devices, a network of networks that allows them to communicate, and apps that allows us to accomplish things using permissionless innovation, the combination of those three things are going to commodify excess capacity. Now, what was commodified in the Industrial Revolution was labor. The commodification of labor dramatically changed the way people had lived in villages. Once we had a money economy, it meant that you could no longer acquire food and clothing through traditional means. You had to have some source of money income. The commodification of excess capacity, likewise, is going to induce an enormous set of changes. Now, I'm a political scientist, at least for the last 30 years I've worked in political science. And in political science, we all understand that science is a two-by-two -two table. We're in a business school here today, so in some ways this is advanced science. So I presented here a three by three table. <laughs> so if I talk too fast, let me know. Now, what I've put then as columns are levels of transactions cost, and what I've put as rows are levels of excess capacity. Now let's think about the way excess capacity might work. If you look at the bottom right cell, <coughs> I am an assiduous brusher of teeth. Nothing creepy, I only brush my own teeth. But still, every day for two or three minutes in the morning, and two or three minutes in the evening, I brush my teeth, which, which means that for 23 hours and 56 minutes, 54 minutes a day, my toothbrush hangs there in its holder, unused. That is excess capacity, but it's unlikely that we can think of an app that would allow us to sell that excess capacity. So probably there's not going to be a, a, sharing, a toothbrush sharing app. On the other hand, 
This is a little embarrassing to admit. I have a BMW 330. It's shiny black, has a six-speed transmission to 160 miles an hour, and I'm just the sort of ass hat you think I am. <laughs> <laughs> Cutting in and out of traffic, flashing my lights. I'm very proud of this car. Now, when I go home and I approach my house, there's a magic shrine that I store this car in. Now, it's a garage, but as I approach, the door magically comes up because I have a garage door opener. I pull the car in, and I then store my car in a place that is warmer, safer, and cleaner than more than 50% of the people in the world live. But I spend all of that space and storage costs on my car. Now, I am also, for a long time, I was, for 10 years, I was the chair of the economics department at Duke. And I had 35 faculty in my department. And if you're an administrator at Duke, for long enough, you get one of the parking spots of God. <laughs> and for faculty, parking spot really ranks above almost everything else. Not salary, but everything else. So what that means is that my car is always being stored to places because my garage either has the car in it or it's empty with nothing else. And that parking space right near the administration building is always either with my car in it or it's empty. So I paid for my car three times. I paid for the money that's tied up in having this car. I paid to store it in my garage, and I paid to store it in the parking spot. Now, I drive my car about 20 minutes each way, 40 minutes a day, probably four days a week. So that's 160 minutes a week. There's a lot more minutes in a week. It should be possible to commodify the excess capacity that the unused part of my car represents. But suppose that I pull up in my shiny black BMW, and a young woman is walking on the road, and I roll down the window, and I say, hey, you want to ride? The police get called, it's like a thing. I, I have a friend, I, I have a friend. But the fact is, it should be possible for me, if I have a car in a few minutes and you need to ride, to be able to find a way to have a mutually beneficial exchange. And one of those apps that connects people over phones through the internet is called Uber. Uber is a way of selling reductions in transactions costs. Now, a whole lot of you have used Uber, and we sort of take it for granted. And that's the best value proposition. So the part of the graph here that I said was the best value proposition was when there's high excess capacity, but we can find a way to sell reductions in transactions costs. So another example that many of you know of is Airbnb. The thing is that what these apps that sell reductions in transactions costs do is transform liabilities that we had to pay to store into assets whose excess capacity we can sell. They transform liabilities we had to pay to store into assets, the excess capacity of which we can sell. What that means is that it changes our idea of what storage is. In fact, 50 years from now, I expect many people will look back on this day and age and say, isn't it odd that they spent so much time and money trying to prevent people from using their stuff when they weren't using it? Why are we so obsessed about storing stuff and keeping other people from using it? If, by sharing it, we could actually also make money. So it's actually not even in our self-interest to do it. Now, we don't necessarily have to share things. There are some things, and I tried to label it hipster heaven here. My son, Kevin, is 29 years old, lives in the Lower East Side in New York. He's a graduate student at NYU. And he always burns his mouth on soup because he has to eat it before his school. <laughs> that was a hipster joke, I can wait. <laughs> well, right across the river from Kevin's apartment in Brooklyn, there are bearded young men and bearded young women in flannel shirts <laughs> making pickles, designer pickles. So a $14 jar, a very small jar of pickles that's bourbon, maple, bacon, garlic. 
Now, you wouldn't be able to sell pickles for that price if you had to have a physical bricks and mortar location and expect people to take the subway across the river. But if you can have an online site to sell them and deliver them via Uber, reducing the transactions cost of finding and delivering those products, that's way better off. Now, when I was growing up in rural central Florida, a lot of products were delivered to our house. Eggs, milk, cheese, bread, many things were delivered. How do we acquire food now? Well, for the most part, we get in our car and take it out of the garage, which remains empty after we leave because that storage space is dedicated to the car and nothing else. We drive that car to a large impermeable area, usually a pretty valuable piece of real estate, and we call that a parking lot, but a lot of the time when the store is closed, it's just empty, it's not used for anything. We park our car in it. We get a shopping cart and we walk around the aisles of the store and we take items down off the shelves of the store and put them into our shopping cart. We then take the cart to a counter where a human being takes them out of the cart, runs them through a scanner, puts them in a bag, and puts them back in our cart. We then take our cart out to the car, remove the bags from the cart, put them in the car, drive our car to the storage area called the garage, remove the bags from the car, remove the food from the bags, throw the bags away. That's a lot of transactions cost. It ought to be possible to sell a way of reducing all those transactions costs. And so the thing to think about is, well, there's a bunch of problems with that. Every problem you can think of is a value proposition for some entrepreneur. Every problem that you can think of is a value proposition for some entrepreneur. And there's dozens and dozens of things like that. If you can just find a way of selling reductions in transactions costs. I want to tell a story of three men. First is a little bit embarrassing. Douglas North won the Nobel Prize in 1993, but I finished my dissertation in 1984, so I have absolutely no reason to mention that. But there it was. At my dissertation defense, being an economist, Doug asked the question. Being an economist, I went to the board and started writing on the board. And I really wasn't addressing his question. Finally, after two or three minutes of pain, Doug raised his hand mercifully and said in a voice that you might use to address a well-loved but not very bright child, <laughs> Michael, the answer is transactions cost. And it turned out that for Doug North, it didn't matter what the question was. The answer to all the questions is, well, transactions cost. And I'd like to adopt that convention here today. But the answer to pretty much all questions is transactions cost. It certainly simplifies things. Second hand is Ronald Coase. Ronald Coase, famously in 1937, answered a question. And his question was, if markets are so great, why are there firms? Markets economists often trumpet as being an almost magical way to direct resources towards a higher value use. But what markets use is prices. But markets, by their by firms, by their nature, suppress the market mechanism. Well, why is it that firms do this if markets are so great? And the answer is, <laughs> and they rise up and speak as if with one voice, uh, and say, transactions costs. Because the answer is transactions cost. Every firm faces a make or buy decision. So if I'm making cars, I might want to own the steel plant that makes the steel for the cars. I probably don't own the iron ore mine, and I certainly don't own the farm that produces the wheat from which I make bread for the employee cafeteria. Well, the margin on which firms decide to expand or contract the set of products that they themselves make rather than buy is determined by transactions costs. But I think that if Ronald Coase were alive today, he might ask a different question. Ronald Coase might today ask, why is it that we own so many things rather than rent them? The answer is the same, transactions costs. The reason that we own so many things and store them is that what we want is immediate, convenient access to the stream of services that's represented by the durables that we store. I don't want to have to take the time to go rent it, but that means that I pay a lot of storage costs. There's nothing intrinsic about the desire to own many of these things. If instead, 
we could acquire through an easy rental contract those same services. So the reason I had the drill on the first picture of the drill on my first slide is I don't actually want to own a drill. What I want is two holes in the wall right here, right now. But the easiest way for me to get two holes in this wall right here, right now, is to own a drill. Because the inconvenience and expense of acquiring a drill or hiring someone to do it is so high. But that's not necessarily true. That's something that entrepreneurs get to work on. The last map is the widget. Economists use the widget as an abstract stand-in for almost any good or service, and look at it. It's pretty manly. It's hard metal that has a bunch of interconnected gears and it has no apparent purpose. <laughs> so when we consider the widget, let's imagine that person A owns the widget and values it a dollar and will accept any offer greater than a dollar. Let's assume that B wants it and will pay any price less than $5. Now in some sense, B should own this widget. And if there's some means of B acquiring it, then we would expect that B would make an offer to A. And usually when economists talk about exchange, we assume a bunch of things away. That is, A and B know each other. They know each other's preferences. They know the currency in which they can exchange, and they trust each other. But suppose that none of those things are true. Suppose that we don't know each other. Suppose that we traded different currencies, the distance is great. We are prevented by transactions costs from consummating this transaction. Once you start to think of it that way, it may be that there are no transactions. And in fact, it's not even a commodity because no one has ever thought of selling it. We've never thought of this thing as being a commodity because the transactions cost are so high. Well, let's suppose that the transactions cost are seven. Since the surplus of the transaction is only four, we've never thought of this as a transaction, and A just stores it, even though B wants it. Well, let's suppose that an entrepreneur, we'll call her E, has a piece of software, an app, that reduces transactions cost by $6, down to just $1. Well, then a transaction is possible. B could pay $4 and be better off by a dollar. A could receive $2 and be better off by a dollar. E could license her software for a dollar at zero marginal cost. Once the software exists, it's easy to reproduce. And she makes a dollar. And transactions cost are to markets like friction is to physics. One dollar of transactions cost is just burned up in the process. But notice that three people are made better off. A makes a dollar, B makes a dollar, and E makes a dollar. And the widget moves to a higher value use. There's no change in the amount of stuff in the world. All over the world, stuff is in the wrong place. All over the world, stuff is in the wrong place. And the reason is transactions cost, which is the friction of markets. It means that mutually beneficial movements of commodities are prevented. And we often think of transactions cost as being something that's just a fact of markets, but it doesn't have to be, because entrepreneurs can find ways to sell reductions in those transactions costs. Well, I've said transactions cost a bunch of times, so let me give a better definition to make it easier to remember. I think them all start with TR. Triangulation, which is just information about who we are, the location, agreeing on terms, including price. The actual transfer, that is, I have to deliver the product or service, and I have to make the payment, and trust. We have to have a way of outsourcing, outsourcing the assurance of honesty and performance of the terms of that contract. Now, I have a storage unit from hell. And I probably should get rid of it, but it makes it much more interesting to give talks about it. It's actually worth the money. I have an outboard motor. I have a big outboard motor. It's probably worth it at least $3,000. I do not have a boat. <laughs> so I have a storage unit, because it only cost me $175 a month to store the outboard motor. And it's worth $3,000. I also have a bunch of crap for my two hipster sons who every time they leave an apartment have leave a bunch of stuff. And I also have all their papers and stuff from high school. Oh, someday they'll want this. No, no, they won't. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't bring myself to throw it away. I've had this storage unit with that outboard motor and all of those tables and chairs in it for four years. Multiply 48 times 175. What should I have done? 
I should have invested instead in a pint of gasoline and a match and set the whole thing on fire. So the only reason that we have these storage units is transactions cost. The only reason I have a closet is transactions cost. The only reason I have kitchen cupboards is transactions costs. Excess capacity is variable with respect to the transactions cost of reassigning the durable good. It's basically a theorem. I look at my closet or garage, I don't see excess capacity, I see storage of valuable items. I think of that as being a service. Most of y'all probably have a lawnmower at home. That's crazy. If you go through suburban Lubbock, the yards are not that big, but everybody has their own lawnmower, which they use for 30 minutes once every 10 days, or if your neighbors yell at you, 30 minutes every 7 days. We could share lawnmowers. We could, five of us could get together and have a better quality lawnmower that actually starts. But we don't because of transactions cost. It's hard to find each other, it's hard to agree on a price, it's hard to deliver, it's hard to trust each other. Now, a number of apps have worked to solve this problem. And so there's an app that now coordinates the use of snowplows. A lot of people have trouble if you're in a neighborhood where the city may not do the snow plowing right away after a snowstorm. But each of you would pay $20 or $30 for to have your road plowed. Well, if there's 100 of you, that's $2,000. It takes the, the snow plow an hour to do it. It'll certainly take $2,000 for an hour's work in a neighborhood. You should be able to solve that problem. But normally we can't because of transactions <coughs> costs. Lowering transactions cost raises the opportunity cost of idle durable goods. That doesn't translate into excess capacity until we have a way of selling those reductions in transactions cost. So this is a credit to the Austrian way of thinking about economics. We tend to think about excess capacity as being a technical problem. It's not. It's an institutional problem. Set capacity, excess capacity varies inversely with transactions costs. Now, a number of things have happened that make me think some of the effects of the sharing economy and the middleman economy may be pretty rough. This is a picture of Mark Andreessen. You may remember he did a famous op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in November 2011. He said that software eats the world. Now, I should know I did not retouch this photograph. He's an actual human conian. <laughs> But what he meant by software eats the world is that software is to service jobs as robotics and automation are to production jobs. Software is to service jobs as production and automation are to production jobs. That is, they destroy them. Let me give two quick examples. The city of Seattle recently decided that they wanted the workers who worked in fast food restaurants and other places to have a living wage, so they raised the minimum wage to $15. $15 an hour. Now, if you go into a fast food restaurant in Seattle, what do you not see? Workers. Because what used to happen if you would go into McDonald's? Well, you go in and you find some words on the board, you say those words out loud, and the worker behind the counter finds the corresponding words on the cash register and punches those buttons. Just turn the cash register around. All you have to do is turn the cash register around. Then instead of looking for the words on the board, I look for the words on the cash register. I press those buttons. I'm actually more likely to get my order correct. <laughs> and then, it asks for my credit card, I give my credit card, I pay, three workers have lost their jobs. You multiply that across all the fast food places in the whole city, thousands of people, number of hours being worked by minimum wage workers in Seattle has fallen by 30% in the past year. As a consequence of this perfectly politically logical attempt to provide a living wage for workers, we're accelerating the process by which software eats the world. One of the things to remember about economic revolutions is they don't care what we think of them. They're going to happen anyway. They don't care what we think of them. The economic logic is going to happen no matter what. And our attempts to solve the problem by slowing the process and supporting wages accelerates 
the process that we actually are trying to stop. Second, second example, about a year ago, I was in Toledo, Ohio. Is anybody here from Toledo willing to admit it? All right, good. <laughs> I was in Toledo and landed pretty late one night at the Toledo airport. Our, my flight had been delayed because I was off Delta, delayed every last time, always. <laughs> and got in about 11 30, 11 45, and I got my bag and I noticed that there was a guy standing behind, beside the door waiting to turn out the lights in the airport. They were done. We're going to turn out the lights. And I thought, how am I going to get my rental car? Because the Hertz counter was dark. My phone buzzed, and I take it out, and it says your car is in slot A39, and here is your access code. So I go outside, and there's a little box, A39, if I press the access code, that box opened, and my key was in it. Three people used to work for Hertz at the Toledo Airport. One at the counter, one to hand out the keys, and one for security. All of them have lost their jobs. Two hours a day. There's one guy who works for Hertz in Toledo. He works two hours a day. Comes in in the morning, washes the cars, puts the keys in the box, and goes home. So software eats the world. All of the things that software can do will be replaced. So when we own things, the answer is we want the stream of services that come from them. Then we ask, let's see. Do you hitchhike? No. You don't hitchhike? No. Why not? I have a car. Does anybody use a lot car? How does it work? Great. Can you describe how it works? I'm not a very good lawyer. Uh, it's like an Uber. Uh, uh, you can move from city to just like an Uber, but hitchhiking. So the point is, there's a truck that's going from Brno to Prague in the Czech Republic. It's going anyway. There's an empty seat. The question is, will that empty seat be filled by a paying customer or not? Now, Uber, that drunk guy would not drive his car to where you're going to go. But blah blah car is a pure saving. Blah blah car, the app provides four pieces of information. Where are you now? Where do you want to go? When? And how much do you want to talk? <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. I want to go, I'm in Brno. I want to go to Prague tomorrow morning at 9. I want to go to the main train station in Prague. And I want to, I want to do it at 9 o'clock. And I really, really like to talk. There's three levels you can pick. There's blah which is, I don't like other human beings very much. <laughs> There's blah blah, which means according to the software, enjoys a natter. Or blah blah blah, which means rarely pauses even for breath. <laughs> so that means that I can hitch a ride on a vehicle that's going anyway from where I want to go to where I want to go and find a conversational partner that will improve the atmosphere along the way. And it'll be 10 euros. The train will be 100 euros. So there's no reason not to hitchhike, except that the three problems, triangulation, transfer, and trust, are very difficult to solve. But if you have an app, you can solve that problem. If I were giving this talk in Slovakia, if I were giving this talk in Romania, half the students in the room would have used blah blah car in the last week. Blah blah car doesn't compete with Uber, it competes with trains. But it's, it's a pure saving. What I want to emphasize, it's a pure saving. Because that truck, that car, would have been going anywhere. It's just selling, it's commodifying excess capacity. So um, this is from England, the picture of a blah, blah car. This is probably like four, four hipsters that just stopped at the coffee shop. It's not the way I think of blah, blah, blah car. But it's the way that you want to think of it. <clears throat> At Duke, and I'm sure here, there are a lot of people who don't live in the immediate area or maybe go off for the summer, but you have a bike to ride around campus because the campus is pretty large. Now, when you leave for the summer, you need to pay to store your bike, and that might cost $20 a month. Suppose that instead you could rent out your bike reliably. 
how much would you need to rent your bike out? Well, remember that it costs you $20 a month to store it. Suppose you have a reliable way of renting out your bike for $2 per month for the three summer months. That actually pays you $66. Three times the 20 storage cost that you, that you save, and three times the $2 that you make from the rental fee. Now you might say, well wait, that's creepy, I won't get my bike back, it won't work. Yes, what Spinless for software does is solve the three problems of triangulation, transfer, and trust. You have insurance that if your bike is damaged, you'll get a payment for it. And when you think about it, it's just a more intensive use of existing resources. Rather than someone having to buy a new bike, we're making more intensive use of existing resources. We're reducing the footprint that each of us has in the world by sharing the durables that now we're paying to store and paying for twice. First, the cost of the thing, and second, the cost of making sure no one else gets to use it, which is all that storage is. A number of you, and I don't want to ask because it's too embarrassing, but a number of you older gentlemen may have at some point thought, it would be great to have us a motorhome. I'm sure we use it all the time. No, you won't. It sits in your garage. It sits in your driveway. Suppose you said you could rent it out. Well, if you could rent it out reliably and have a piece of software uh, like Outdoorsy solve the problems of triangulation, transfer, and trust, you could probably afford a better motorhome. And other people would be using it too. You wouldn't always be paying to store it. Now, I don't want to ask who has used Ashley Madison. I was giving this talk at Carleton in Ottawa, Canada once. And an elderly professor, I put this up, but an elderly professor got up and ran out. So I don't know if he wanted to check his account or... <laughs> but the, the, the point is that there are... Settle down. The, the point is there are transactions costs of things to which we want to attach social disapproval. That's a transactions cost too. But economic revolutions don't care what we think about them. So, one reason that some married people may not have affairs is the fear of getting caught. But they want to have an affair. Suppose you could reduce the cost of having that affair by making it less likely they'll be caught. You can make money by doing that. Well, is that a good thing? Economic revolutions don't care. So a lot of things that we value, a lot of institutions that we've come to count on, may be swept away. Now, most of you know or have used Uber. I've used it so much that it's sort of surprising to me now when I find someone who doesn't know it. But I was in Canberra in uh, Australia last August. And we had to go to a place quite a, a long way out of town. Uh, Jeffrey Brennan lived, lives quite a way outside of Canberra. And an elderly uh, Polish philosophy professor and his wife didn't know how to get there, and so I said, well, come with me, we'll take an Uber. And I don't know what that is. Come with me, we'll take an Uber. So I go to their house, I call the Uber, Uber shows up, they sit in the back seat, and I, I sit in the front seat, because it's Australia, and they'll hit you if you don't. I talked to the driver the whole way, and I could see the professor looking for a meter, because if you travel a lot in the world and you're in a taxi with no meter, it means you're going to be kidnapped. <laughs> So he's pretty unhappy about this. I wasn't really thinking, we get there, and I say, all right, see you, and get out. He's furious because he thinks I left him with the bill. So he gets out his wallet and starts to pay, the driver just is sort of creeped out. No, man, it's all good, it's all good, no worries. Finally, he got out, he just, I think he just thought we were, we were crazy. But it's, it's easy to forget how seamless an Uber transaction is where you don't actually have to call the dispatcher three or four times, you don't have to give directions, and you don't have to pay. The payment is made, but you don't have to handle the problem of payment. Likewise, from the driver's perspective, the driver just has on his phone or her phone where to go and doesn't have any money. So she's not a target to be robbed. You don't have the same problem that a taxi might have in the same setting. Well, and on that same trip, I had a chance to make a kind of Darwinian prediction. And let me say, let me ask this question. What is the difference between an entrepreneur and an economics professor? Usually about five years. 
The entrepreneur thinks of it, and the professor thinks of it about five years later. So that's what happened in this case. When I thought of a genius idea, I thought somebody else has already done it, and they had. But you may, you may remember the case of the Star of Bethlehem Orchid. Star of Bethlehem Orchid has a really, the flower is built so that there's a very long part of the petal, and there's a little dab of nectar down at the bottom. That was pretty expensive for the flower to do. But Darwin looked at this and made the prediction, well, there must be a moth that has an eight and a half inch long tongue. And the moth is specialized to only go to Star of Bethlehem orchids. And then it only goes to other Star of Bethlehem orchids, and it'll, it will uh, pollinate other Star of Bethlehem orchids. So rather than having a general pollination strategy, which is expensive, there's a specific symbiotic relationship between these two species. The thing was, no one had ever seen a moth with an eight and a half inch tongue. As far as people knew, it didn't exist. Darwin said it must exist. That's the only equilibrium solution to this. And there it is. So it, it wasn't found until decades later. But there is, in fact, a moth with an eight and a half inch tongue. I got to thinking about ride sharing. Let me ask this. Orbits or expedient. Orbits or expedient. What do they sell? Reductions in transactions cost to the access to things that sell reductions in transactions cost. So it's a meta reduction in transaction cost. Because airlines and hotels have websites to make it easier for you to find the terms of the arrangement you want to make. What Orbits does is curate those for you. So it occurred to me, I pulled out my phone and I was going to take Uber, but there was a 3.5 surge. And I think, wow, that's bad. So I get out of Uber and I go to Lyft. And it turns out that Lyft didn't have a surge, but it was a 20 minute wait for a car. So I had to think, well, do I want to pay and not be late? Or would I rather pay less and be late? Shouldn't there be an orbits but for ride shares? That was my Darwinian prediction. I thought, well, there should be orbits, but for righteous, there should be a software app where I just go to it, and it tells me all of the locations of all the rideshare cars and all the prices. And of course, because I'm a professor and not an entrepreneur, that's exactly right, and it's called Go A to B. So one of the fun things that you can do when you're a professor is to try to imagine the things that entrepreneurs have already done. And with the internet, you can go find them. Because <laughs> they do totally already exist. You didn't think of it, you're not that smart or you would be a professor. <laughs> and the new version of this is actually fair compare. So if you're in a city, fair compare is actually pretty useful. And sometimes there's six or eight of these ride shares and the difference between waiting time and cost can be significant. Most of you probably wouldn't buy a plane ticket without looking at orbits. Why would you buy a ride share without looking at fare compare? And it's even in Russia. So the middleman revolution, what I want you to remember is that what's being sold is the reduction in the transaction's cost of exchange. Not products or services, but the use of a product or access to a service that already exists. So let me tell two quick stories and then sum up. Suppose, well, I have 35 acres of forest land south of Pittsburgh, North Carolina. <coughs> um, it's a warehouse or tree farm that we bought 12 years ago. And we are trying to grow and harvest those trees in a sustainable way. We're just at the point where we can start taking some of them for soft timber. Up until now, we've only harvested them for uh, pulp wood or paper products. Um, I've secured the services of a forester to help me with that. And I hope to leave that, those trees, that land, for my sons. I, mean, it's, I like the idea that it's habitat for deer and other things that I can shoot. But I also like the idea that I'm providing habitat and a lot of carbon is being taken up by those trees. 
So whenever my friends ask me, you know, we fly a lot, yeah, I got 35 acres. I have 100,000 pine trees, what do you got? <laughs> but one day I go down there, let's suppose, and I hear, boom, 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 boom. That's supposed to be a chainsaw. I did that once and an elderly professor sitting in the front row refused to pay two rows back. <laughs> So I do try to say it to wake people up. I hear chainsaws. I see three guys with chainsaws and two with forklifts, and they are loading up my trees and putting them on trucks. And I say, being from the South and therefore polite, hey, y'all, what are you doing? And they say, oh, you're probably the owner. Yeah, owners tend not to understand market economies. In the market economy, the consumer is sovereign. And we are able to provide forest products, saw timber, and paper at much lower costs to consumers if we are not obliged to pay taxes, all the regulations that we normally have to go through. So this is really about consumers. And that sort of pisses me off. So I dial 911 and men with guns come, not my sons. The Chatham County Sheriffs, they're heavily armed. And they arrest the three men, why? Because I have a piece of paper called a title. And that property does two things. First, it says that I get to use this land. And second, you don't without my permission. And if you try to, and I say you don't have my permission, men with guns will come. Now, psycho libertarians like me have some questions about some of the things that the state does, but Protection of private property, that's up pretty high. I think protection of private property is a pretty good function of the state. Why is it, I want to ask, that so many people on my side who would say, yes, the men who are taking those trees should be arrested, would have a very different reaction if I'm in New York and I start to hail a taxi, the taxi pulls up, and I say, oh wait, no, this is too expensive, I'm gonna take an Uber. Because I look up there at the front of the taxi cab and I see that medallion. And what does a medallion say? Medallion says two things. First, if you have this medallion, you can drive a taxi in Lower Manhattan. Second, if you don't have one, you can't. What do I tell the taxi driver? Oh, you're probably a medallion owner. You don't understand market economies. You gotta realize that consumer sovereignty is the key here. If I don't have to pay for this medallion, if I don't have to pay for the license, if I don't have to pay for the insurance that I have to have for a taxi, I can deliver rice at a much lower cost. And so I'm going to have Uber instead. Why is it that so many people on my side are so happy about state protection of property rights, but think that it's just fine that the state breaks its promise to the taxi medallion owners. After all, the taxi medallions were sold by the state for a specific promise. Taxi medallions cost $350,000, $400,000, up to $750,000, maybe a million dollars. The state took that money and was paid in good faith and went to use it for other things. Why is it okay for us to steal the value of the taxi medallions, but to say that we're gonna protect private property? And then, the second story, again, by which I need to uh, provoke questions. How many of you have a power drill at home? Everybody has a power drill at home. Why? Transactions cost. Now suppose that instead of owning a power drill, I pull out my phone, I scroll down to power tools, I scroll down to Uber, and then I scroll down to drills. I press drill, I drop the phone because I'm done. Somewhere, I don't know where, I don't need to, an Uber driver is told by the software to go by a hardware store and pick up a commercial quality power drill. Then, that Uber driver drives a route that is determined by the software to optimally solve the traveling salesman problem to have the minimum total trip required to do all the deliveries. 20 minutes later, my phone buzzes again. There's a smart pod in front of my house that only I can open when my phone gets close to it because it has a chip. 
So I go out with my phone, the pod opens, there's my drill. I drill two holes in this wall because my wife wants me to hang a, a large, heavy picture. And she says, no, not that wall. <laughs> you think I'm making this up. So I, I, go over, I go over to this wall and I drill two holes. And now I'm done and I put the drill back in the smart pot and it costs two dollars. Doesn't cost me any time because all the delivery is taken care of by the software. The smart pod calls Uber, who, who then picks up the drill and takes it to the next delivery. If you have enough density of transactions, you can very quickly make back the cost of this drill. Now, that all seems good, but it leads me to this question. Suppose that it's true that we will be able to share rather than store because we have purchased so many of these consumer durables. Almost all tools, almost everything that you have in the kitchen, the bread maker, the sausage maker, the espresso maker, things that you don't use that often, but will be really expensive and inconvenient to, make, to, to rent. Well, what's going to happen? One thing that's going to happen is that price, prices are going to fall dramatically. Prices are going to fall dramatically because we can rent over the own. On the other hand, we only need about six or seven million power drills in the United States, not 110. There's 110 million power drills in the United States. Consider you rank power drills from most to least used, from the most used to the least used, and then take the 55th millionth power drill, which you guess is the lifetime use of the 55th million power drill, between 30 and 40 minutes. The total amount of time that that motor is spinning is between 30 and 40 minutes for 55 million and less for all the others. We can get by with 7 million power drills, which means that almost all the people who used to work at Starbucks or the Toledo Hertz or making power drills or driving taxis once cars are driverless and once trucks are driverless, no truck drivers, wages are going to fall. Now, economists have a way of summarizing the net effect of this called real wages. Real wages are the nominal wage divided by the price level. My claim is the price level is going to plummet. My claim is that wages are going to plummet. What is the net effect? Well, it's not going to be uniform. For many people, the net effect is going to be very positive. For some people, it is going to be very negative. The question is, and it's really two questions, how can you, students, position yourself so that you're in a place where you can take advantage of the changes that you're going to have to live through? And the second is, how can we as a society try to choose policies that at least mitigate the damaging effects, the destruction of the institutions that we've come to depend on, like long-term 14-hour-a-week jobs? If we can begin to answer those two questions, then I think we can start to think in a clearer way about the revolution that has started all around us. Thanks for listening.